Today I had the golden opportunity to talk with Sheldon Dingwall of Dingwall Guitars. Dingwall basses are known for their revolutionary design, their tight low end and the fan frets. I really enjoyed talking to Sheldon and I hope you like it too. Here's my interview. Sheldon, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much. Ed. Um, welcome to Holland, uh, because for the people viewing, we are in the Netherlands at the moment, in a small town called Krimpen aan de Lek. It's very close to Rotterdam. Before we kick off, what is your connection to Holland? Well, this is my first time here, um, but in Canada, uh, there's there's quite a large Dutch population. Um, many moved over in the 50s. I'm not yeah. sure why, but um, uh, they all- Labor. Also... Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Farming. Um, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, that's where I met most of them. They were they were in agriculture. Yeah, um, and uh, one of my early mentors who who gave me my start with learning how to use heavy duty machinery uh, was from Holland, and uh, he was originally trained as a chef, but had. Um, transitioned into repairing antiques um and he was like the go-to guy for antique repair and i hung around his shop and he took me under his wing and taught me how to grind my own uh, knives to carve next like when i say knives i'm talking knives that go on a on a machine oh like the big cutters yeah yeah and um and he taught me he taught me how to use uh, what's called a shaper mm -hmm. and so uh, it was the most interesting experience because this knife would be about this long, spinning like this, and you'd feed the neck into it, and you'd watch the grain disappear, almost like an MRI of a, of a human body. Yeah. This was an MRI of, of wood, and, and it was a really interesting experience. Super dangerous. I can still count to 10. I don't know how, um, because... When something goes wrong, it goes wrong at, at the speed of light, and it's just, and that could explode right in front of you. Dangerous. Very dangerous. Is it still, uh, do they still use the, that kind of equipment nowadays? Um, yeah, more in, um, uh, you know, there's, there are levels as you progress through um, manufacturing guitars. Mm -hmm. And um, you, know, you start off with the machinery you can afford. Yeah. And uh, you learn to use that, and it's a really good experience. Um, and as you, as you gain experience, you start to realize how dangerous this is, and you start to buy safer machinery. Hmm, yeah. um, and uh, uh, these days, we use CNC machines, um, which, uh, in, in my opinion, they're just another tool. It's like a, a, a different kind of paintbrush that allows you to control things in a different way. But it all comes back to a chisel. Yeah. Um, even though it's high-tech computerized machinery, it's just a chisel that's spinning that's controlled by a computer. Yeah. Yeah. The, the connection to Holland. Mm. There's a famous Dutch bass player. Yes. Who was very much a fan of Dingwall basses. Unfortunately, he's not amongst us anymore. He died, uh, I think, two years ago. Yes. His name is Henny Vriente of the famous Dutch ska band, pop band called Doemar. Yes. Have you heard of him? Yes. Um, he uh, had a Super J uh, four string. And uh, unfortunately, I never had a chance to meet him. Uh, always wanted to because uh, I'd only seen him in photos and read about him. And uh, uh, he just seemed like like the most elegant gentleman. He kind of reminded me of John McLaughlin. Uh, had that kind of vibe, that that uh, very elegant um, uh, vibe. And uh, yeah, would have loved to have met him. Yeah, I can understand. Yeah. Let's talk about your first recollection of of music, guitars in general. What's your first memory? Very first memory would be like a lot of drummers, um, waking up before the rest of the family and crawling into the kitchen and pulling out pots and pans and hitting them with spoons. Cool. Um, that was my first memory. Uh, second memory was, uh, I grew up in a musical household. Um, everyone was a musician. Um, and, uh, we had a baritone ukulele, and my older sisters um, had a book, and they were studying. Um, I couldn't read. I was too young. Um, and I strummed it and thought, this sounds terrible. And so I retuned it at, at the age of four to an open chord. And wow. um, I don't know what the chord was. It was just whatever sounded good. And it uh, drove my sisters crazy because they'd pick it up and try and play. And it was like, no, it's supposed to be tuned uh, standard. Yeah. Uh, and then my third memory, which influenced um, my career was uh, being at the piano and I remember 
being eye level with the keys, so four or five years old, and I'd run to one end of the piano and, and hit the treble keys, and it'd be plink, 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 and I'd run to the other end, and it would just... I remember the richness of the lower notes, and I always loved that sound. Just the roll, I'd hold the note and just hear it sustain. And um, uh, I never forgot that. And later, uh, as I uh, started to build basses or started to investigate basses, that was the most influential experience mm. of my life. Yeah, the low, the low tones. Yeah, and pianos. Yeah, pianos. All right. I heard you say, not standard tuning. Mm -hmm. And that's, that struck a chord with me about your fanned fret system uh, that, that you imply on all your uh, bases. Is that something not being standard, maybe a, a red line, or how do you say it, a, a line throughout your career? Yeah, you know... Um, Trying to look for other things that yeah, work? For sure, yeah. I don't know if it's an ADD thing, um, or just a creative uh, mindset thing, um, but the the desire to to explore and find something that's that's newer and better and um, uh, however, uh, fan frets are multi scale. Um, uh, they they started three thousand years BC um, on harps. Oh yeah, um, and, and and harps have been the same way ever since. To, relatively speaking, long bass strings and short treble strings. Can you explain for the people who don't know about fan fretism, the multi-year skill system, what it what it does and what the the, the benefits are? Sure. Like if you if you think of a harp or a piano, um, uh, harps and pianos both cover a wide range of frequencies, from the lowest notes to the highest notes. And if you look at orchestral instruments like the violin family. Um, It takes four separate instruments to cover that same range of, of uh, frequencies. So mm -hmm. the the uh, double bass, the cello, the viola, and the violin. Um, and if you look at those instruments, they're longer scale, medium scale, shorter scale, and really short scale. And so the, um, the idea of having longer and shorter scale lengths in music has been around forever. Um, and it's, it's, it's physically what you have to do to, to achieve those different ranges. Ralph Novak in the late 80s. And, and multi-scale is not a new concept either. It kind of came in favor and then went away and came in favor or went away. And then in the 80s, Ralph Novak um, was trying to create the perfect Les Paul Stratocaster. Okay. And um, everybody was putting a humbucker into a Stratocaster, trying to make it sound like a Les Paul. What did it sound like? It, it sounded like a Stratocaster with a humbucker. Yeah. And Ralph was the first guy to go... Well, the beauty of a, of a Les Paul are just these fat treble strings, and the beauty of a Stratocaster are these bright wound strings. The difference is the scale length. Why don't I try just doing Les Paul scale on half the neck and Strat on the other half? And he went to go do that, and he went, oh, wait a minute. I can't bend strings if the, if the yeah. frets are half and half. Hmm. Well, I'll just connect them and make them diagonal. Wow. And uh, that was all the thinking that went into it, it was just an experiment. And when he strung up that guitar, um, so shorter treble strings, longer bass strings, um, and then the frets just um, angled to make that work, um, he tried it for the first time and went, oh my God, this is way better than I expected. And it, it went on from there. And when did you, like at Dingle Guitars, um implemented it for the first time was it like the, the first thing you 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 did no i started um uh the first thing i started with was uh designing and building uh floyd rose style locking trims hmm. um because i couldn't afford one and they weren't available in canada so i thought well i'll make one and um and so i used that uh on on my guitars for several years toured with them Um, and then I was building necks and bodies um, just for myself yeah. and uh, testing those on the road. And my, uh, my plan when I decided I'm, I'm, I'm too old to be a professional musician, it's not going anywhere. I was 24 at the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was the right move for me because there are musicians and then there are true musicians. And, and uh, I was a good musician, um, 
but I was a long way from being a great musician who could make a living at it. Okay. Um, and so my original business plan was just to make a replacement Stratocaster next for some reason next fascinated me hmm. still do. Yeah. Um, that led to complete guitars that led to people asking for basses, uh, five strings with a good sounding B. And that's where I was like, I'm not a bass player. I don't know anything about building basses. Yeah. But I know pianos sound good with low Bs. So what are they doing that What's I could apply secret? to a bass? Yeah. yeah. And it came down to scale length. So um, did experiments and, and realized for, for what I wanted to hear, what I wanted out of a B string, um, it required a 37-inch scale. And I thought, well, that's, that's fine. But nobody will want a 37-inch scale. It's just it's too long. Hmm. And so I thought I'd hit a, a roadblock. Um, and then I was at a Luthier's convention where I met Ralph Novak. And, you know, the, it, it's interesting when you meet people. You just instantly like them. Or maybe you instantly uh, don't feel comfortable. Uh, with Ralph, I just instantly liked him. We both felt comfortable. Um, and we talked about uh, how this would be fantastic for bass. And, yeah. and uh, Ralph said, well, you know, I'm, I'm more interested in guitars. Why don't you take basses and I'll do guitars and uh, we shook hands and and I went back to Canada and six months later I had the original design can you can you remember the first time it was finished and you plugged in for the first time yes um, January 13th 7 30 in the morning um, I had a flight to go to Nam uh, at 9 30 and I'd worked all night finishing the bass Um, which was common back then. Um, and um, I remember plugging it in, going, sounds amazing. Took the whole base apart, put it into a case, got on the plane, and off to NAM. That was just in time for the NAM show. I mean, yes. was it like building towards that moment? I have to finish it before NAM? Yes. And, and so so that, that, that NAM, 1993, um, um, company was tiny. Uh, we were more focused on repairs at that time, just to be able to uh, have an income. And um, so uh, I didn't have a booth at NAM. And back in those days, you could actually walk in with a guitar and show it to people. You can't do that now. No. Um, but so it was absolutely incredibly fortunate. Um, I, uh, the first musician I, I bump into it was Steve Bailey. And I show him the bass, and Steve was the most incredibly uh, gracious, and uh, he became my NAM host. And we walked through the entire show together, and he introduced me to uh, Victor Wooten, and he introduced me to Keith Horn and yeah. and all of his um, uh, friends. And, and uh, so without that warm welcome, I would have been lost. I can imagine. Yeah. It's a do-or-die moment. Yeah, yeah. You only have one shot. Exactly. <laughs> And um, and so at that time, Bill and, and Pat Bartolini, they were like the, the mom and dad of all the young base builders. Um, Rob Elric, uh, Ken Lawrence, uh, Lakeland, um, uh, and us. And, um, and so they would let all us young builders who couldn't afford a booth put a base in, in their booth. Oh, and that's so, gracious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it advertised their products, um, but it gave us this concentrated group of young bass builders, we all hung out together and, and, uh, and we're still all friends. Um, but you know, it was a real sort of gestation period for a lot of these small companies. Mm. Wow. But that's, that's amazing. Nowadays you, you need to buy a, a booth, a place at yep. the table. Yep. At yeah. that time it was, and it was uh, a moment for you if you didn't had that chance. Yeah, exactly. It kind of, you know, uh, on, a, on a much smaller scale, kind of like the artists um, in the 20s in, in Paris where they hung out at cafes together and, uh, you, you know, you feed each off each other's creativity. Yeah. Yeah. About uh, the, the production of a bass. Mm -hmm. I don't know. How long does it take when you have an idea for a certain style from like the idea till the moment that it's tested and ready for production how how does that process go and how long does it take you know that it varies and it depends on how busy you are and how many roadblocks you hit and how fussy you are 
Um, uh, I had no artistic training um, because I was strong musically. When I was 10, I was pulled out of band, or sorry, pulled out of art class to play in the band, which wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, hmm. But that's what, that was forced upon me. Yeah. And so I haven't had a, a, an art class since I was 10. Um, so everything I learned about 3D CAD, about uh, how curves interrelate, it was just from just staring at them, trying to figure it out. Doing it. And so uh, that base on the wall there, um, it's a traditional base, but um, I redrew it three times over a period of two years, just trying to get everything aligned, everything to flow together. Um, and I mean, it's a pre-existing shape. I mm -hmm. didn't have to create it. Um, so it could take months or it could take years. Um, and uh, to really dial it in, I think, is more in the in the case of years for me at least. And also because the the electronics, the the pickups are also like angled. Yes. Is that because of the the length of the the scale, right? Yes. So they would be lined up with harmonics, hmm. and um, uh, um, uh, years and years ago, um, a, a friend of mine studied um, the different relationships and he worked it out as percentages. I put it in my phone back then. Well, it was a Palm Pilot back then. And uh, I still refer to it. Um, yeah. You know, precision is uh, a certain percentage of the scale length and a jazz is a certain percentage, 60s or 70s, depending on, yeah. on uh, where the bridge placement is. Do you ever like challenge those numbers? Yes. Yes. So if you look at the bridge pickup on that, mm -hmm. um, I have no idea what the relationship is. It was moved tonally. And um, so pickups, when you test them, um, you can test them by themselves and try and find a position that you like. Um, but then if there's two pickups, how do they interact? Yeah. And, you know, three millimeters will change the mid enough that you will notice. And so it became a, a case of listening to it soloed, listening to it blended. Uh, we do both series and parallel. So now you have two combinations that have to work together. Yeah. And so positioning becomes very, very um, a trial and error. Yeah. So how long does that process take? Um, you know, if you, if you sit down and concentrate and you have a, an instrument... Um, that you've prepared with a big space that you can move the pickup wherever you want. Uh, it can go relatively quickly. Um, so maybe an afternoon and you'd have it dialed in. It's like, okay, this is the sweet spot. Yes, yes. But is it something because I mix a lot of my own records and I can do it in like an afternoon, but I can also do it in three weeks, mm, you know, because right. it's never done. Yes, yes, Am yes. Am I trusting my ears good enough? Yes. Is that something that is goes for for this also it's 100 percent um especially with pickup design because pickup design at least in my experience you wind a pickup and it's like a new baby and it's like wow that's amazing that's incredible um it's perfect we're done yeah and then the next day it's like you know what I, I, it's not as magical as i remember we better wind another one yeah and that can go on and on and on and on so dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, pickup prototypes and what kind of bass player do you have in mind when building like a new bass is is there like uh i'm building it for this kind of player or no do you, do you like always do it for your own ears own ears mm -hmm. however that may change because uh, i had an interesting experience we've been building bases for 30 years 30 plus years um very specific tone in mind um and i i uh, saw you too uh, so there's another um, Dutch connection. Um, oh, yeah, the, uh, the drummer now. Yeah, nowadays. Oh, yeah, amazing drummer. Yeah. Um, so had a chance to to um, meet Adam Clayton. Had a chance to uh, see them at the Las Vegas Sphere, which was absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, oh, the technology is incredible, um, and the band was incredible. Um, they rehearse like it's their first gig. They, you know, uh, every day they'll rehearse, um, sometimes for hours uh, yeah. before a show. Anyhow, um, that was the first time I'd really um, uh, paid attention to Adam's playing and his tone. And I, I it finally got it that the only way the edge can do what the edge does is to have somebody like Adam below holding everything together. Mm. And it was like a master class in... in um, 
solid bass. Yeah. And that changed my thinking about bass tone. And so, yeah, now, now we're going to be adding capabilities of that tone into our basses. And if you explain that more, what kind of things sonically are you then looking for? Sonically, it was very rolled off, uh, uh, mostly low frequencies, and we've we've focused on um, the harmonics. Um, bass players tend to talk about this bass has a great fundamental. Well, in my opinion, every bass has great fundamental. A rubber band on a box has great fundamental. Mm. The fundamental kind of takes care of itself. Um, but if you listen to pure uh bass frequencies like in 20 hertz 40 hertz man you can barely hear anything mm -hmm. um it's the harmonics that carry all the information that as a human you'd interpret as pitch uh or as a musical information and so um we've always focused on that end end of things and and with longer scale the harmonics become more in tune with the fundamental and the information becomes i mean We have two tiny eardrums that are trying to process every single vibration yeah. in the air. So what we've done is we've tried to make that information as clear as possible so that it's it cuts through and it mixes as easy as possible. Tight. And tight. Yeah, tight bass mixes much easier than big, woofy bottom bass. Yeah. Um, but there's room for big, woofy, heavy bottom bass in a more sparse mix, and, and it can fill things up. Um so that the guitar player can be free to not have to do rhythm all night to be able to create that end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's like a new perspective you got from the gig out of the, the sphere. Yes, you too. 100%, yeah. Wow, looking forward to those new bases then in the, in the future. I am too, <laughs> I am too. It, it um, you know, and because we've spent so much time working on uh getting the the second and third harmonics lined up with the fundamental we've got that covered hmm. and now when we add this now we've just opened up and created a whole new palette of colors that doesn't take away from the palette of colors that we already had are you already busy in that process trying to find out yeah it, i mean it's a, it's a simple fix um um uh i haven't had a chance to experiment with it yet but um With, uh, we've done it enough times that uh, I'm, I'm confident that we can do it easily. Let's talk about the new product line, the okay. Dingwall Super P. Yes. Um, it was just made as a custom shop previously, right? Exactly. And yeah. now it's going yeah. into production. Can you tell something about it? Yeah, I mean, probably 10 years people have been asking for a production version of the, of the Super P. Um, We, when you make things by hand, um, especially at a very high level, um, it doesn't matter who you are, it's going to, you have to work slowly. Um, and because we don't build thousands of instruments, you never gain the job rhythm to be able to do very clean work fast. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, building instruments slowly in North America or, or Europe, it, it's expensive. Um, we all have to eat at shop for the same groceries pay the same money for gas, pay the same rent. Um, and, and, uh, and so good art is expensive. Yeah. Um, but musicians, um, uh, musicians live in a world where their competition, uh, for a large uh, degree would do it for free. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there's a second currency that nobody talks about. And that's the currency that feeds your soul. And, uh, as an artist, um, that means everything to have this soul filling, um, currency. Yeah. And so if you, if you play a gig for free, you still feel fulfilled, although maybe your, your stomach's empty. Hmm. Um, very few lawyers practice for free. Um, if you just call them, they will send you a bill. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and so that's a completely different spectrum where they focus on more on paper currency versus soul currency. And so the only way, um, uh, the only way to lower the cost of, of an instrument is either lower the quality of materials or lower the quality of, of labor or both. Um, and uh, we come from a custom shop world and our values, um, they just don't align with lowering the quality of materials. Mm -hmm. And so we're left with um, lowering the cost of labor, which um, we go offshore to manufacturing partners who have uh, access um, so they can 
they can pay a decent wage relative to their area, um, and uh, and then they would do ninety percent of the work. We ship the instruments back to Canada, and we have a team that does the last ten percent. And it's just like in anything, the the final ten percent is the most expensive, yeah, um, because that's where you need all the precision and and the refinement. Hmm. And uh, so, yes, the the SP one will uh, make its debut towards the end of this year, and uh, two years in refining the design, and then the last piece of the puzzle was creating pickups that took us in a new direction that we'd never been before. And, it, and uh, we had to go outside of traditional pickup making to create something that sounds traditional. Yeah. And you found it. Yeah, it was, it was pretty exciting. Now, this is a whole new uh, horizon that we can explore. Yeah, great. I was also wondering, um, a bass amp mm -hmm. is very important for the sound. Yes. Um, I heard that uh, the dark glass... Mm -hmm. New combos are going to be uh, released. The 500 watts 210 and the 112 analog and digital. And you have like an interesting relationship with Dark Glass, I've I heard. Dark Glass is an interesting company. Started by Douglas Castro, and uh, uh, the uh, the story he told me was that Dark Glass came from people just uh, mixing up his name and uh, of Douglas, <laughs> and um, and uh, he started from nothing, and he's completely self taught. Um, and um, when I first met him, uh, he didn't even look like he was out of high school yet. And uh, he was building bass distortion pedals. And uh, I thought, why would you want a bass distortion pedal? And of course, if you solo, if you solo, um, you know, a lot of classic rock, uh, classic rock bass tracks, the bass is usually um, uh, saturated and, and um, it just works better in the mix that way. So Douglas was on to something long before anybody else. And uh, in my opinion, he's an absolute genius, a genius designer. Uh, Frank, who does his uh, uh, industrial design work for him, is also a genius. And so we've worked together um, separately. Uh, we came together to work on a single project back in, in 2013 uh, with Adam Nolly Getgood to create mm -hmm. a, a base that used dark glass electronics. Um, had Adam's input and then Dingwall bass. And that was the first time we worked together. And it, it was basically like sitting at a table. We all went for breakfast together at, at NAM and we bounced around ideas. Um, Doug handled the electronics version, uh, end of things. Um, I, I dug my feet in and, and, and it was my position that, you know, there's, the world has enough three band EQs. And we don't need another three band EQ. What's what's yeah. the point? How can we do something different? And eventually, that led to uh, a gentleman named Mark Stickley. He was having a conversation at the other end of the table, and he went, "You know, it's a bass. Why do you need a treble?" And I went, "Oh, wait a minute. If we don't need a treble, that frees up one of the controls to be a high mid." Hmm. And so Adam was sitting next to me, and I said, "Adam, what do you, what would you think about this? What would you think about no treble, just bass, low mid, high mid?" And Adam went, "Yeah." That'd be perfect. Doug was sitting at the other end of the table. Doug, what do you think of this? And um, uh, Adam, what frequencies would you choose? And he uh, uh, conveyed that to Doug. And Doug just sort of got a blank look on his face for 10 seconds. And he went, yeah, I can do it. Cool. <laughs> 
and that became that was in Disneyland, and that became you know one of the one of the most used preamps in in heavy music in the last 10 years. Wow! Yeah, talking about heavy music, you've got you guys have been uh, uh, endorsing a couple of big heavy bass players. Mm -hmm. You you talked about Adam Nolly Get Good from uh, Periphery. Yes. Uh, Jacob Umansky, uh, Kyle Conkiel, yep. uh, Earl Pereira, Gary Lalonde. The list goes on and on. John Taylor, Duran Duran. John Taylor, Duran Duran, yeah. And Leland Sklar. Leland Sklar. Talking about legends. Leland is, he's the most amazing guy in the world. Just as a human, um, I know nobody better. Uh, and as a bass player, again, um, uh, Leland is so talented that you almost don't notice it because nothing sticks out as being out of place. Hmm. And yet... <clears throat> the reason he's been on 2000 albums is because he can just go in and in one take, maybe two takes for safety, uh, nail it. And, and how did you guys meet up? How, how did, did he become an endorsing artist? I had to go to the washroom. Um, it was our first NAM. And, um, and so it's like I, Ralph Novak and I shared a booth and Charlie Hunter played at that booth, which was amazing. I'd never heard him and, and I never forgot that performance. Hmm. <clears throat> but um, I had to go to the washroom, um, and so I left the booth, went around the corner, and almost bumped right into Lee Sklar. And um, uh, again, this is one of those one of those things where you just you like somebody Im immediately. And Lee can't get through Nam without somebody saying, "Lee, can you try my bass? Lee, can you try my bass? Lee, can you try my bass?" And, and normally um, uh, he'll say no, um, yeah. but this one time, <clears throat> the relationship just sort of. Right from the get go, it was uh, we just liked each other. And he thought, "Oh, okay, I'll I'll give this a try." Um, brought him back to the booth. Um, he tried the bass and spent probably an hour there talking and playing and and um, and went, okay, sure, yeah, I'd love to take one into the studio. So we built one, we sent it to him, and he recorded an album with Brian Wilson. Brian Wilson? Yeah. The Beach Boys? Yeah. So that was the first album he recorded was one of Brian Wilson's albums. Wow. That was on a Friday. Um, Monday, he calls up and says, I'm in. Um, uh, whatever you want, I'll, I'll be an artist, I'll endorse, whatever you want. Um, but this That's is like a massive compliment. Huge. Yeah, huge. Um, he's, and he said, there's only one thing. Um, the frets are too big. Could you make me one with mandolin frets? Mandolin frets. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> what? What? <laughs> um, because I came from the guitar world, 80 shred, and you know the biggest frets were not big enough, and mm -hmm. and so I thought, well, it's a bass, so it needs even bigger frets. And again, having one of those clear memories from this was 30 years ago, having, but it seemed like yesterday. It's that clear in my mind. Built another bass for Lee, and I thought, okay, I'll put mandolin frets in, um, set it up, and the first time I played it, it was just like magic. Same neck. Everything was the same, and yet the neck felt much more slender, easier to play. You could slide up and down the neck, and it wasn't clack, clack, clack. It was note, 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 note. Really interesting. Wow. And, um, and so the bass before that one for Lee was the last bass we ever used large frets on from that it was just like okay we're, we're never using large frets again we hung them on the wall and they I don't know what happened to them but they they never went to, into a bass again he switched the mandolin frets due to Lee's Clark yeah 100% um, now uh, mandolin frets are tiny tiny mm -hmm. um, so we went one size up from that which would be banjo size or Martin acoustic size um, did you tell him <laughs> on his they still They're, okay. they're always Mando, yeah. um, but on everything else to make it more production friendly and more friendly for customers um, uh, who would be afraid of mandolin frets. Um, It's very specific. Very specific. Mm -hmm. um, and they, if you make too much of a change, and, and this is coming from a guy who, who makes multi-scale bases in, in funny colors, <laughs> um, <laughs> if you make too much of a change, um, it scares people. Um, and some people, you know, have about roughly half the population uh, have an adventurous open mind and the other half of the population are more risk averse and change scares them. Mm, yeah. 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 That's how people work. Yeah. I guess. We, we need both. Yeah. Yeah. And 
other artists uh, that are uh, like John Taylor from Duran Duran. I was to work with with a legend like like him. Kind of intimidating, actually, because um, I'm, you know, uh, I grew up in the Duran Duran era, and I was a fan of the uh, the band, and we used to play Duran covers in my band. Hmm. Um, and so to to actually get a call from his tech and and, and saying, you know, John would like to try on your bases, um, it was like, are you, are you serious? I thought I was, I thought it was a prank. Hmm. Um, And once we figured out that, no, it's not a prank, he's in Canada, we have one day to ship a base to him, we just dropped everything and uh, and we put a, a base together, set it up for him, um, broke every speed limit on the way to the FedEx office, yeah. got in one minute before five and and uh, we got it into his hands and and um, it's it, it was a slow process of, of him adjusting To the base, like he got the base right away, but um, you know when you're playing in front of two thousand people, ten thousand people, um, you do need to put the best performance on that you can. And you need to get acquainted with your instrument. Yes, and and so that took took several years, um, but it was a slow and steady process, and eventually it got to the point where um the process um led to him saying you know i'd like to talk to you about a uh, a, a signature model and so i flew out to london and we had a meeting at um at his rehearsal space and so i got to see all the cool the inside gear and then like the the stuff they collected and it's it's eclectic and and cool um but in parallel with that, um, in 1995, I had a conversation with a Nashville session guy. And he was talking about um, how in Nashville, it was the thing at the time was to take a Rupert Neve recording console, yeah. pull a strip out, and turn it into a rack unit. And I thought, why would you do that? And he said, oh, because they just sound amazing. And from that conversation, I was just like, wow, wouldn't it be cool to work with Rupert Neve someday and create a bass preamp? Man, I would ever love to do that. Yeah. But I'm, I'm a little dingwall in Canada. They wouldn't even take my phone call. Um, and I felt that way until the John Taylor signature. And then it was like, oh, well, now maybe we have an artist that they would go, yeah, we'll, we'll work with you. So we thought, huh, let's, let's, let's give it a try. It turns out that uh, their entire engineering team are bass players. And they'd never done an onboard bass preamp before. So it was like, oh, hmm. this could be fun. So um, we we worked it out and uh, gave them some specs and some guidance. And and, uh, and and when I say that, loose specs, loose guidance, just from the perspective of how, yeah. how long do we want the batteries to last and things like that and what frequencies roughly are we looking for. They did everything else. Those guys are magicians. Um, they sent us uh, a single prototype, and um, like within seconds, it was just like there's there's magic. Hmm. Whatever's going in is coming out sounding better, um, even before you adjust the EQ. And uh, I don't know how they did it. They they didn't use measuring techniques. Hmm. It was all ears, and so they they built. The general circuit, and then they ordered in every appropriate um, uh, op amp that that they thought might work. Yeah, probably a dozen, and then they additioned op, op amps. Tried which one, yeah, worked best. Different manufacturers. Which and one sounds the sweetest? With the John Taylor signature bass at that time, uh, cool. it wasn't a signature bass then. It was this was just the preamp portion of it. Yeah, and once we had that, then we approached John and said, "Listen, we've been working with Neve." Um, and John's initial idea was he wanted to have um, a signature bass um, for the anniversary of the Rio album. And guess what console um, they recorded the Rio album on? I think a Neve. <laughs> It was. <laughs> and so he was like, Neve? Yeah? Oh, that'd be perfect. Yeah. Cool. And so we had, to, we had to pull a lot of strings to make everything happen. Um, But we got that Neve into John's uh, into John's bass, and then feedback from uh, Bernie, his tech. Um, John has a very specific playing style, and and uh, Bernie was asking, you know, could you could you make these modifications to the knobs to work with John so that um, um, 
uh, it would just work better. Yeah. And from that, um, I kind of did a U-turn and instead of going with the three band preamp, went with, um, we typically have five knobs. Um, and the first three knobs I turned into a passive system. Um, we've never really on our active basis, never really used a passive tone. Mm -hmm. Never really, I couldn't wrap my mind around having two treble controls. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I had to work it out that it's not a treble control, it's a tone control. And over here's your treble control. And, um, so we played with the tone of the, the, uh, the capacitors to change the tone of the tone control to, um, work in harmony with the treble control. So they, they sound different. And that led to um, the ability to interact between the passive tone and the active yeah, treble. Yeah. And the Neve treble is so quiet, you can pin it on 10 and there's no hiss. No. And so now you have this wonderful opportunity to just have this magical sort of interplay wow. between the two controls. And I think he was happy with it, John. His, uh, his exact quote was, this is the best sounding bass I've ever recorded. And, um, and his engineer and producer, um, who won a Grammy for, um, uh, uh, Uptown Funk, uh, he worked on that song. Yeah. Mark Ronson. Um, Mark Ronson worked with, um, uh, Josh Blair. Oh. Uh, Josh Blair was the engineer. The engineer yeah. Ronson was the producer. Producer, yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah. And, and Mark Ronson actually works with Duran Duran quite a bit. Yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. Um. It's a small world. <laughs> yeah. Are there any artists that you would like to have as an endorsing artist? Are there any artists on your wish list or uh, is that something that just happens? It kind of just happens. Um, to answer your question, Sting would be a first choice. Um, and uh, my expectation of that happening is... It's probably zero chance. <laughs> Maybe he's But, watching. Sting, if you're watching, give it a try, man. Come on. <laughs> yeah, why not? Um, Getty Lee would be awesome. He's a fellow Canadian. Um, I'm not even sure he's aware of us, but uh, um, uh, I've always been a fan of Getty. Um, I'm sure there are more, and I'm probably forgetting something very important, but those are the first two names that come mm -hmm. to mind. About the future, what what is like the, the future for Dingwall Guitars? Well, um, it's interesting the 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 world is in such an, an upheaval now, it seems. And uh, uh, I think everybody's kind of scratching their heads going, what's going on? Um, culturally, uh, it's been good for us. Uh, the worst thing for us was the retro trend uh, that happened sort of late 90s. Mm -hmm. um, that just took the wind out of our sails. Uh, we almost went out of business. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, most trends last five years or, or so, you know, uh, how long did new wave last? How long did disco last? You know, five grunge. Yeah, grunge. Yeah, yeah. Five years. Five years and it's, and it's gone. Yeah. Um, retro, man, it just, it just, it just never seemed to get to quit. And it's hmm. just in the last couple of years, uh, gone away for us at least. Um, and so I think this turmoil is is maybe forcing people to look to the future and going, uh, you know, let's make a better future. And so for us, that fits perfect because what have we been about forever? Let's make a better future. Let's make a better bass guitar. Yeah. Better music, better everything better. Like not, you're not uh, stuck no. in the past. No, I'm, as I get older, I'm learning a greater respect for the past. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I uh, was guilty of not respecting the past when I was younger and more arrogant. And, um, uh, but now I hopefully have lost a little bit of arrogance and, and um, am ready to learn and grow more. Um, but uh, so far, uh, the guitar industry, the bass industry, traditionally um, uh, the, since COVID, took off like crazy during COVID. And then yeah. after COVID, it was like a ball falling off a table. Yeah. And, um, uh, but for us, um, it, it, the, the growth is still unbelievable. Like I'm, I'm scratching my head going, this, this can't be happening. And yet um, uh, our sales are almost doubling at this point. Is, is it probably due to like Instagram, TikTok? I see a lot of clips of talented people 
trying to stretch the limits sometimes even of human capacity yeah. playing yeah uh, but also on i instrument use is it something you are looking at or uh, seeing that same trend maybe that boosts yeah sales yeah um do you remember in the 80s when when it was all about shred guitar and mm -hmm. and 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 everybody was trying to outdo themselves with technique um uh and we noticed the same thing with the bass guitar in the last 10 years um not to the same degree um but but the, the bass player went from being sort of this forgotten guy in in the back that serving yes um, and and that's still an important role, mm -hmm. but added to that is is a more upfront bass player with a more upfront tone and and um, uh, it, and in the last ten years, bass has changed. Um, you know, for not a lot of money, you can buy a really nice home audio system as, as, that has great bass. And so, in the history of listening to music, it's never been as accessible to the average listener. And without knowing it, their ears have been getting a better education in quality audio than mm -hmm. in any point in history. So the average listener has higher expectations. The sound systems are better capable at producing bass. And so we've been quietly working away in the background, working on a better source tone for bass. Yeah. And, um, and I think, you know, our strategy was um, during the retro years where, where it was really, we were struggling was oh, if we just do it better, maybe, we'll attract more customers and just do it better. We'll attract more customers. And so we just kept trying to do better and trying to do better. And, and so when we actually did uh, start to connect with, with more musicians, we already had something that had 20 years of really hard work and refinement in it. You already put the labor in. Yeah. 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 Amazing. And you started with electric guitars. Yep. You, you are essentially, an electric guitar player yourself. Yeah, yeah. Is there any chance that you will make Dingwall electric guitars again? You know, I I think so. Um, we've we have guitar uh, designs on on the drawing board now. Um, the problem is uh, uh, we have over three years of custom work ahead of us. We have three years worth of people waiting on on custom orders. Well. Um, even on the production uh, instruments, we call them ready to play, but um, um, they'll be ready in a year, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so, so it would be an insult to those customers for me to direct any of my energy towards a guitar instead of working on trying to get them uh, their basses to them quicker. Mm. Um, so, you know, in, in the future, but not in the very, very near future. No. When there's time at hand, yeah. You're like, what should I do? Okay, let's make a guitar. Exactly. Sheldon, I always end this podcast with uh, you meeting your younger self. Mm. And you have one question. Of you, you have one advice you can give to your younger self. What would that be? Dude, don't stress so much. <laughs> <laughs> Famous last words. Thank you very much, Sheldon. Yeah, thank here. you so much. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening and watching this episode of Guitar Man, the podcast with Sheldon Dingwall. If you like what you've seen and heard, please don't hesitate. Subscribe to my YouTube channel to get more guitar-related content in the near future. And leave a message in the comments because I'd like to know what you think about this episode. See you in the next video. Bye.